Good morning and good evening to our viewers from around the world. My name is Alfred Ball and I represent Education USA and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. Today's Facebook Live event is in honor of the 2018 Paralympic Winter Games, which are now underway in South Korea. We want to congratulate all athletes taking part in the Paralympics, an international multi-sport event for athletes with disabilities. Our show is aimed at international students who are interested in playing for college sports teams in the U.S. We will be discussing student-athlete recruitment and we'll have NCA representatives Mike DeCesar and Sarah Turner joining us. They will share their insights on how athletics and academics go hand in hand. If you have questions you would like them to answer during the program, just post your question in the comment section below. I'd, li I'd now like to introduce you to Liam Haycock, who is an international student athlete. Liam is from Great Britain and is a collegiate soccer player for the University of the District of Columbia. Liam, uh, soccer is a very popular sport overseas. What attracted you to playing soccer uh, as a student athlete here in the United States? I believe uh, playing here as a student athlete is a big thing overseas. Um, it gives you the chance to come here, study and play the sport that you love really. It's an opportunity to get a full-time education, an opportunity to play the sport you want to and it's a great experience really. It pushes you on to further endeavours going further on in your career really. So it's both professional and personal development and enrichment. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's a breath of fresh air coming from another country, experiencing what it's like to be educated, the American system, and also being able to play a sport in a professional environment, really. It really was a shock for me when I came here to realize how seriously competition and the NCAA take college athletics, really. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Liam, what piece of advice would you give our um, international students who are interested in studying here in the U.S. Um, and on being a student athlete in general? The piece of advice I would give firstly is to make sure it's certainly something you want to do. Being an international student and coming over here as a student athlete carries a lot of burdens really. It's a big step to make and it requires a lot of hard work, prep preparation, and it's definitely something that international students have to be aware of before making the, de the decision to go into being a college athlete. So get the information, find out about what the, what, yeah. you know, what's on offer, um, and certainly you know, that's, that's very good advice. Um, what were some resources you found helpful when you started applying to colleges and getting the attention of sports recruiters? I think for me, I was very lucky to have people around me who influenced my path coming here. Um, they were always very helpful in telling me that the American college athletics was a great opportunity for me, myself, to come over here. And I would say to everyone else um, that the resources I used widen them. Don't just keep yourself limited to who you talk to. Um, obviously you're going to be talking to coaches, talking to them about your prospects of coming here. And also I spoke to college recruiters who help you along the way to get in where you need to be. So were there, were, did you actually speak to universities and deal with people in the U.S. at colleges who then could tell you more about their specific programs? Certainly, yes. Um, obviously my point of reach was the head coach first. And when I talk about head coach and I'm at the University of the District of Columbia, I spoke to the head coach of soccer at UDC and he was very informative. We were open communication, we were able to talk to each other about what sort of things needed to be done and how I go about the process of admitting into the school, really. Got it. So don't be shy, reach out. Yeah. Um, and I assume reach out widely. Yeah, reach out widely. Make sure you keep your options open. Don't just limit yourself to one because you're going to need backup plans and make sure it's the right choice, the right commitment. Absolutely, absolutely. Liam, thank you for joining us today. Um, if you want to hear more from Liam, he will be participating in our Facebook chat. Just ask your questions in the discussion section below. 
Uh, he'll be online to answer your questions throughout the rest of the program. I would now like to introduce uh, Sarah Turner and Mike DeCesar from the National Collegiate Athletic Association, better known as the NCAA. The NCAA is a member-led organization dedicated to the well-being and lifelong success of college athletes. Sarah works for the NCAA's uh, Customer Service Center, and Mike is the Associate Director with the Eligibility Center. Sarah and Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you tell us a little more about the NCAA Eligibility Center and the work you do with student athletes? Thank you for your interest and for the opportunity to speak with you today. We are hoping conversations like these will help our students and their parents start to understand what requirements students will need to make play collegiate athletics in America. While we won't be able to cover everything you'll need to know about our process today, we want to make sure you know about the resources we have available. Our websites at nca.org can provide a wealth of information about who we are, our requirements, transfer information, and most importantly, information specifically tailored for international students. If you need to contact us with questions about your account, you can find the international contact form at www.ncaa.org forward slash international. If you plan to register for an NCAA Eligibility Center account, you will need to visit www.eligibilitycenter.org. One of the things we wanted to point out is the help button on the top of the screen includes additional resources and links. We are also active on Twitter and Instagram if you'd like to follow us for updates. If you want to know more about the National Letter of Intent, please visit their website at nationalletter.org. For more comprehensive information, please check out the Guide for the College Bound Student Athlete and the International Standards Guide. The links for these two guides can be found in the comments section below. The primary function of the NCAA Eligibility Center is to help ensure students that are coming into NCAA Division I and II schools are academically prepared for college and that they meet the NCAA's definition of amateur athlete. It is important to remember that the certification of athletics eligibility is separate and distinct from being admitted into a particular college or university. Just because you are certified to compete in athletics by the eligibility center doesn't mean you have been admitted to the particular school. And similarly, you may be admitted to a school but not certified as eligible to compete by the eligibility center. If you are a transfer student going to a Division I or a Division II school, you will still need to be certified by the Eligibility Center, at least for amateurism. Please check with the Compliance Office at the NCAA Division I or Division II school you wish to attend to determine whether you need an academic evaluation as well. NCAA Division III schools conduct their certifications on campus, so students would not need a certification account with the Eligibility Center. However, Students do have the option, as does everyone listening today, to create a free profile page that would provide us the information needed to send you periodic updates and reminders. We have touched on some of the differences between the three NCAA divisions already, but the next graphic does a nice job of showing more detail. As you do your research about what type of college or university you want to attend, it is important to find a school that fits what you are looking for both athletically and academically. It's important to note that fewer than 2% of NCAA student athletes move on to professional athletics after finishing college. So we encourage you to study hard, research, and find the right fit for you and your family. We'd also like to point out for Division Three, there are no athletic scholarships available. Students are only eligible for non-athletic aid. Okay, Sarah and Mike, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we uh, appreciate that, that information. I'm sure our viewers are going to have lots of questions. I understand there are academic and amateurism requirements. Could you tell us a little bit more about both of those? Um, so on the academic side, we require students to complete 16 core courses in the core subject areas of English and native language, mathematics, natural and physical science, social science, and additional core courses like philosophy, foreign languages, and non-denominational religion courses. You can see the breakdown of credits by division in the slide. We utilize the students' transcripts for years nine and up to find the 16 core credits, as well as determine their grade point average from those courses. In addition to transcripts, students will also need to complete the SAT or ACT tests. 
you must be deemed a final qualifier or receive an automatic waiver to be eligible for practice, athletic scholarship, and competition during your first year in the university. When you register with the NCAA Eligibility Center, you will be asked a series of questions about your sports participation history for each sport that you'd like to play in college. This information will be evaluated to determine your amateurism status for NCAA Division I and Division II colleges and universities. Common issues that we see are listed on the slide here. These are issues that can limit your ability to play your sport in college. Ultimately, we want to guard against professional athletes competing against student athletes. One of the most common occurrences we see with international students is that of delayed enrollment. For most sports, the NCA allows for a grace period of one year to delay enrollment after completion of secondary school studies. But any additional delay beyond that could incur eligibility penalties. I think that's enough to get us started. Hopefully this intro has sparked some questions. Thank you so much, Sarah and Mike. Uh, this is extremely valuable information, and we have a lot of Facebook questions from our viewers. In order to get uh, to as many questions as possible, I would like to uh, ask you both to keep your responses brief um, so that we can get through as many as possible. So our first question is, what happens if we lose our good standing or rating during our college education? So what can, what can happen if, uh, if you lose your good standing or rating is that that can limit your ability to keep playing. You're expected to maintain good grades, uh, and meet a certain GPA requirement, uh, set both by the NCA and by the school you wanna attend. And if you're not meeting that expectation, uh, you won't get to practice, uh, you won't get to play in games. And also uh, your scholarship could be in jeopardy at the end of the day. So it, it's incredibly important to work just as hard in the classroom before you get to college um, as you do once you get to college. So serious consequences. Uh, our next question is, when should I start contacting coaches and can I ask them about scholarships directly? So you can always reach out to coaches. Um, on most websites, there is a contact form for prospects. And so if you wanted to reach out to coaches, there's that prospects form, you can call, you can email. Um, there are no restrictions on you reaching out first, and you can always talk about scholarships. That's something that we would actually encourage students to talk about so that um, the expectation is set up front. Uh, thank you, Sarah. We've got a good follow-up question. What's the best way to contact the sports recruitment offices of each university? It depends on each university, but I know a lot of institutions use that form to get as much information about students as possible. Thank you. So reach out, as Liam said, don't hesitate. Use the form, but you know, send an email. Um, email. Excellent. <laughs> right. Um, next question is, do we need to make NCAA registration by ourselves, or should our club or federation do that? That's an outstanding question. Um, you know, we ask every student to complete his or her own NCA Eligibility Center registration. Um, and the reason for that is that at the end of the day, uh, we're going to certify you, you know, the individual student. So we're looking we for your take on where you've played, uh, what your grades are, uh, your test scores. You know, and if we need additional information, uh, we're, we're going to go to the student directly to, to get that. So. We strongly encourage the individual student um, to complete his or her own eligibility center account. Uh, certainly a, a club or, or a federation can be a resource. That may be someone we contact to gather additional information, but from our seat, it always starts with the individual student athlete. Thank you, very valuable. Um, which sports are most popular for international students? So we get a lot of soccer players, a lot of tennis players. Track is very popular as well as basketball. So those would be the top sports, but uh, for the most part, we get international prospects and in probably all of our 19 sports for and so, men's and women's. Just to follow on, Sarah, so I assume that students shouldn't limit themselves just because the sport's popular, but in fact, they should you know, uh, try and go for whatever their, their sport is. Correct, yes. If you are passionate about your sport and want to play collegiate athletics in America, reach out to the coaches and figure out if, if there's a team that would be a good fit for you. 
Okay, thank you. Our next question is, what are the NCAA core course requirements? So this is one where it's by division. Each division has their own credits that they need, but for the most part, we are looking for English or native language courses. Um, if you're educated in a country that's Spanish speaking, we will take those Spanish classes. Um, we will need mathematics courses, science, social science, and additional core. The biggest thing that we wanna point out is business and commerce courses are not considered core, PE, art, music, um, those are classes we would not be able to use to certify you academically. So you're looking for well-rounded students? Correct. That, that's fantastic. Um, and it's something that we talk about a lot as one of the advantages of the, you know, the American higher education system generally. Um, our next question is, how long is the certification process with the NCAA Eligibility Center and how much does it cost? So the certification process, it can be very quick or it could take a little bit longer. Um, if students register after they've graduated and they send all of their documents at once and submit their test scores, if we've got an account that's finalized and ready to go, we can finish the account within 10 business days. If we need additional clarification from the school, we can open new tasks and then the timing depends on how long it takes to have those tasks satisfied. Um, for the international fee, if you have attended an international um, institution for high school or years nine and up, the fee is $135. Thank you. Our next question is about scholarships. Um, at what level of sport should I be able to uh, get a scholarship? So I guess how good do I have to be? Um, are expectations or standards? You know, there's there's probably not a a set standard necessarily. You know, the uh, you probably what what we would suggest is you, you know, our coaches are looking for well-rounded students that love to compete in their sport. Yeah, and one thing our coaches also look at is if they're looking at capable athletes. If we use soccer example and looked at you know two talented soccer players like Liam, um, both very good at their sport. And one is, uh, you know, play year round, play competitively. One is a much stronger student than another. Um, by and large, our coaches are going to lean toward recruiting the stronger academic student ahead of um, ahead of the one who's not as strong. Partly for what we said before, it, you know, if that student shows uh, that, that he can get it done in the classroom, he's going to have a great chance of doing good work at his next university, and someone that coach can can count on um, to, to get the job done both, both on and off the field. That's fantastic. You know, that's a vision of saying uh, we want students to succeed uh, both academically and at sports uh, and in athletics. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of the things that we hear frequently from people who engage Education USA around the world. Uh, they talk about what's special about American colleges and universities is that they are focused on student success overall, whether it's in uh, academically, in terms of athletics, or overall. It's, um, you know, it, the, the, the final thing is uh, success and moving on to the next part of your life uh, professionally and personally. Um, our next question is um, about evaluations. How many people evaluate uh, an application at the NCAA Eligibility Center? So we don't have one case manager that's assigned to a specific account. Um, we have a team of case processors, both on the academic and the amateurism side. So everybody in terms of efficiency is going through accounts and trying to get them done. So there's not one specific person. Um, on the customer service side, we are the ones that if people email or call in, uh, that we will talk to you. It's a pretty small team, um, but we're all able to help. Thank you. We have now a specific question about uh, specific sports. Do squash, judo, archery, and shooting sports come under NCAA eligibility requirements? Another, another really good question. Um, yeah, rifle would come under NCA eligibility requirements. Um, uh, judo would not. Um, squash would come under NCA requirements academically. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, we do not provide an amateur certification for squash. 
Thank you. What if uh, students are interested in playing more than one sport? How does that work? Absolutely. Uh, and you know, we're, we're blessed uh, that we have a lot of talented, what we call uh, here multi-sport athletes at, at our Division One and Division II, two schools. And you know, we find that our coaches would just as well uh, have someone who could succeed in multiple sports. So from an eligibility standpoint, um, you know, that student would still receive one academic evaluation that would be good for, you know, every two, three, or, or, or four sports a student might want to play in college. Uh, on the amateurism certification side, uh, the student would fill out uh, sports participation questions for each one of those sports. Uh, my team with amateurism certification would in turn provide an amateurism certification for each sport. Uh, you know, so that could be soccer, that could be tennis, that could be track and field. And once that student is cleared uh, amateur-wise to compete in those sports, uh, he or she can go ahead and play. Um, there is not an additional fee. I think it's important to note um, that the $135 fee that Sarah mentioned before would be the same if a student played one sport or if a student played two or more sports. It's also important to note that if you are a professional in one sport, you can still be considered an amateur athlete in a second. So if you're a professional soccer player that's always wanted to be a kicker or a punter for a football team, give it a shot. That, that sounds like a very practical and realistic approach, um, you know, geared towards student realities. Um, thank you. So is there an age limit for NCAA uh, eligibility? Yeah, that's a very, very helpful question. Um, so the NCA doesn't have a maximum age at which you can no longer, no longer play your sport. Uh, you know, what, what students should be mindful of is that certain sports will, will have an age uh, by which our schools require you to come and get certified and, and start playing or, or you could forfeit eligibility. Uh, a good example, especially since this is a popular sport with our international audience, uh, would be men's and women's tennis. Uh, Division One has a rule that says uh, if you turn 20 years of age before you come and play at a Division One school, you can lose eligibility for each year between your 20th birthday and the time you come to school. A quick example would be a, a 21-year-old tennis player um, that enrolls at school at 21, uh, played tennis between age 20 and age 21, would lose a year uh, of her tennis eligibility. A 22-year-old tennis player uh, would lose two years of her eligibility. So while there's not an age maximum, um, there are certain age requirements uh, by, by which our schools would like you to get in, uh, enroll and start competing. And it, it ties back to something we said earlier. It's the idea that we, we want a level playing field and, and similar, you know, similar skilled athletes competing each other, not, not amateurs competing against professionals. Thank you very much. That's great to hear both the spirit of openness as well as you know, the need to, to check requirements carefully and see where you stand. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, next question is, if we don't have a USA rating, how do we need to, do we need to choose Division Three during registration? So my, uh, go ahead, Sarah, I'm sorry. USA rating in sport? I guess uh, that's how the question came in. Um, so I think it's one of those things, if you are not sure that you're interested in attending a Division One or Division Two institution, we do encourage you to create that profile page if you are interested in coming to the United States to compete. Um, with that profile page, it is free. It's something that is available to allow us to still provide communications and provide updates with policy and what's going on and where in the process you should be. Um, but if you're interested in Division One or Division Two and don't have a USA rating, still reach out to coaches. Um, they may not need it to be interested in the level of competition that you're able to bring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a very practical question. How do I submit my documents? If I mail originals, can I get them back? We do not return any documents. So please, please, please do not mail any original documents. Um, for us, we can accept school stamped copies of your original documents. So if you want to take your originals to your school, have them print out copies and add a freshing stamp, those can be mailed in to us. Um, there are some changes coming, and so if you're currently going through the 
recruiting process or it's something that's coming up, keep in touch with your compliance officer and they'll be able to let you know how to submit your documents after the changes occur. So moral of the story, read the instructions carefully and follow them. Yes, yes. the task <laughs> does warn you, so it is out there. And I might say to all students watching, that goes for all parts of the admissions process. Read the instructions carefully, follow them, get good advice. Education USA advisors uh, you know, are on the ground in 180 countries and territories uh, to help with that process. Our next uh, question is, what happens if a student fails the certification process um, with the NCAA uh, Eligibility Center? Are there other options uh, if the student is still interested in playing college sports? So we suggest if you come out with a non-qualifier decision, if you're not eligible to practice, compete, and receive scholarship your first year, talk with the coach that was recruiting you or the different schools. They may have suggestions. They may allow you to start internationally, your education internationally, and then transfer in. Um, I know some coaches suggest junior colleges. Um, which are two-year options, and then you can transfer in to the Division One or Division Two schools. Um, it's just important to keep the line of communication open if you do receive a non-qualifier decision. And I might add uh, from the amateurism side that every one of our Division One and Division Two institutions, if a student does not get certified as an amateur, it has an ability to appeal that decision. And that's something you can talk about with the coach that's recruiting you and the compliance office at the institution you're interested in, in attending. I'll also stress that more often than not on the amateurism side, it's not a permanent or complete restriction on your eligibility if you have a limitation we, we place in your account. It, typically, uh, the most common restriction is that students will be asked to sit out one year, their first year on campus. We call that an academic year in residence and they'll have something less than a full four years of eligibility. Uh, so you know, don't let that be a you know, black and white deterrent to looking at this option. It's a great option. Uh, and, and your school will work hard with you to try and see if a, if a waiver or another opportunity can go through uh, so that maybe you can play sooner. Fantastic advice. Um, our next question is when should I create, at what point should I create an account? Is there like a a better time or a worse time? If you're being recruited by an NCA institution, go ahead and create an account. Um, the institution will go ahead and use that account to monitor your athletic status as well as your amateurism certification process. Um, if you're not yet being recruited and you are still interested, we suggest registering during or towards the end of your junior year we do conduct preliminary reviews. So if you start providing your documentation and your SAT or ACT test score, we can take a look at your accounts and um, let you know where you are and let potentially interested institutions know where you fall as well. So uh, junior year means two years before, right, essentially? Yeah, your third year of high school um, and if you're in a 12-year system. Got it. Thank you so much. So um, is there a minimum required score for either the ACT or the SCT, SAT for admission as an international uh, athlete on, on a scholarship? So just remember, we are not the same thing as the admissions process. So for admissions into a university, they'll have their own standards. Um, on the academic side, we have something called a sliding scale. So the higher your GPA, the more wiggle room you have with what kind of test score you have to achieve. Um, we do have a very nice and easy to read chart on our website at ncaorg forward slash international. Thank you. I'm so happy we have this next question, especially given uh, the Paralympics going on in, uh, in South Korea. Um, are there any specific criteria for international students with disabilities? Specific criteria, not, not necessarily. Uh, you, you know, the review process is, is going to look the same, you know, for, from the eligibility center's end. It'll be the you know, same academic review process and, and the same amateurism review review process. Uh, and probably a lot of what we, we've said would, would be applicable uh, in terms of getting your name out and, uh, you, you know, communicating, communicating your interest with uh, you know, head and assistant coaches about, uh, about this opportunity and play, playing at this level. Um, so from, from our end, uh, our experience has been not only the certification process, but the, 
uh, the recruitment process and, and what it looks like on campus uh, as you go through your day to day with with classes and conditioning and um, go, going to practice and, and competing in your sport is uh, you know, really substantially similar. Fantastic. So um, definitely encouraging uh, applications from uh, students with disabilities, um, especially in, in the spirit of the of the Paralympics and Education USA centers, our advisors around the world. Uh, are well prepared to uh, talk to students with disabilities about opportunities for study in the United States uh, across the board. Our next question is, can an international student come to the U.S. to finish high school and play for the school first and then go to college uh, in America? Will this give them some kind of, of an advantage in the process? I don't think it would provide an advantage um, per se. The biggest thing that we want to point out is if you do not graduate from your international high school and then you come to the United States and start school as an American student, we have for division one, a core course time limit. So you have to complete all your requirements within a time limit, as well as something called a 10 seven progression requirement. We need 10 of your credits from English, math, science, social science, and additional core, with seven being in English, math, or science, to be completed before the start of your seventh semester in school. So a lot of times, one of the things that becomes very important is when you do make that switch over to America, talk with the high school guidance counselors at your new American high school, ask them what requirements they still need you to meet, as well as make sure you are not completing duplicative coursework. We want to make sure that we give you the most advantageous um, certification possible, and we can't do that if you're du uh, taking duplicative coursework. Thank you so much, Sarah. So um, how long after graduating from high school, from secondary school, does a student have to apply uh, to, does he have or he or she have to apply to a Division I or Division II school? I can I, I can take that one. Uh, th there's not necessarily a a, a time limit. Um, it really kind of in part depends on how soon after graduating from a secondary school that student wants to come over here and, and, and go to college and can compete because of her sport. Uh, I, I will tell you for for all intents and purposes though, our coaches uh, for the coming academic year, and we can use this fall as a, as an example. Uh, most of their recruitment will be done uh, by early spring. In fact, uh, you know, coaches are signing students to national letters of intent for, for those sports, uh, so promising scholarship money. It's one of the things Sarah pointed out, uh, out earlier is that you know, a lot of students will register you know, uh, one year prior to wanting to come to an NCAA college or university so that they can get their account reviewed beyond the radar of our coaches and you know, have the opportunity to come to our colleges the, the fall semester following their graduation. I, I will point out one additional thing is that many but not all of our schools will admit student athletes both in uh, the fall and, and what we call mid-year. Mid-year is also what we refer to as a winter or a spring academic term. Uh, in fact, about 10, 10 to 12 percent of our prospective student athletes enroll mid-year every year. So while the bulk of them do come to school in the fall, we get a considerable population that will come to school in January or February each year. So it's just important to you know be in dialogue with with your coach, what sport uh, you're interested in playing, and, and what that coach's needs are. You know what, when they're looking for you to come on and, and join the team. It's also important based on the amateurism section the delayed enrollment. Uh, component. So you, for most sports, will only get a one-year grace period after your expected date of high school graduation before you have to enroll as a full-time university student or we need you to stop competing in your sport. So that's another component that coaches will consider to make sure that when you do come in, you come in with all four seasons of eligibility and you come in with the ability to start competing right away. Thank you both. That's fantastic advice. Um, it just emphasizes again how flexible U.S. higher education is, how open it is. Um, that's something that you know we've got 425 uh, plus advising centers all around the world, and our advisors are always emphasizing um, that point. Our basic services are for free. 
Um, and so we hope students will come and, and get more information. Um, another question um, that in the Olympic spirit, um, have you, uh, if you have competed at an Olympic level and even won a medal, are you eligible to be certified with the NCAA? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question, and certainly certainly a timely one. Uh, you, you know, there there is not a restriction from the NCAA on on, on you know competing in the Olympics or, or earning a medal in, in the Olympics. You, you know, the, the, the things that we try and, and direct to is that uh, is something that showed up on the slide earlier, and, and Sarah mentioned a minute ago. Uh, you, you know, we are, are looking for athletes who do not financially profit from from playing their sport. So if you're in your country's Olympic pool and you're offered money, you know, as an incentive for, for winning a medal or, or making the finals, uh, your, your best bet for an NCAA standpoint would be not to take that money. You know, that can have an impact on, on your eligibility. You know, similarly, uh, you know, there are time limitations after you finish secondary school in which you can compete without forfeiting eligibility. But, you know, it's kind of a you know, more blanket response. Uh, we see dozens of both uh, what we call incoming college-bound student athletes, as well as our own student athletes who, you know, compete, represent their countries, uh, and do a great job at the Olympics, and are able then to in turn come back and, and play NCAA college athletics. So, you know, we would encourage students, um, you, you know, know before you go. You, you know, know uh, what you can and can't do from an eligibility standpoint, and, and otherwise go out there and uh, you know, represent yourself and your country well and compete at your best. Fantastic advice. So uh, essentially everybody has to do their homework um, and they have to know that there are consequences. A any step may have consequences. Um, and so know those and the criteria. the compliance office can be really helpful with uh, the, the, the do's and do nots with those questions too. That's fantastic. That's a great resource. A legislative line for those that uh, maybe aren't being recruited yet but want some general advice on the rules. So again, we've got a lot of resources. Just give us a call. That's fantastic. Um, so is there a deadline? When should I mail my documents in? So there's no deadline uh, for us. You just can't be eligible for practice, competition, and scholarship until you finish your eligibility center account. So we encourage students after you graduate, especially to start getting your documents in sooner rather than later, because a lot of colleges, um, if you're going to university, a lot of sports may report in August. So get your documents in early, see if we can go ahead and finalize your account so that you can go through the visa process, get your I-20, and start on campus for orientation and for practice. Thank you. And uh, for students watching, we have uh, archived um, interactive web chats on the visa process. If you're interested, you can find those on YouTube. Um, do all Division I and II schools offer athletic scholarships? Sure, I, I'm happy to happy to answer that one. Um, you know, the the amount uh, of, of scholarship uh, you know, really varies by by, by the school and, and, and by the sport. Uh, you know, we have we have sports uh, that that, for example, Division One basketball, which offers full full scholarships, cover, covers the cost of attendance. Uh, other sports uh, we, we call those equivalency sports and. They will have a pool of money that it's up to the coach, how, how the coach wants to divide that pool of, of money among her roster. And, you know, what's usually a determining factor for, for that coach is, you know, the, the players that are getting it done in the classroom, the players that are working hard uh, on and off the field are probably going to get a larger, larger share of that money. Uh, but, but probably the biggest takeaway is that, uh, you know, while all of our Division One and Two colleges and universities offer scholarships for those sports, those amounts can vary and, and often do vary by the particular college or university. So, a great tip to everyone watching today is, as you're talking to to coaches uh, at different colleges and universities, you, you know, be be candid. Ask them what they have available, um, because what one school has available could differ from another school. And between the divisions as well, uh, Division One can offer multi-year scholarships. And so you can know going in for all four years or potentially five years as well, what amount of scholarship you're going to receive. Uh, for Division Two, they only offer year-to-year -year scholarships currently. So every year your scholarship has to be renewed. So I think we have the perfect follow-on question, which is, is there a website 
um, or reference that provides a list of sports that universities and teams are looking for. Uh, for example, a website that would show which schools are actively looking for cyclists. Cyclists is not an NCAA sport. Uh, triathlon is, uh, but cycling in itself is not. Um, we don't have a list that would specifically say what each institution would need. Um, what we do have on NCAA.org under the About Us, there is the ability to search for a sport by school or by division. And then you can go on and use that as your starting point for contacting schools that you may be interested in attending. Thank you. So um, very specific question. Can you explain redshirting? Can a student be NCAA certified and recruited at the school, but, uh, but redshirt to improve academic standing? This is a decision that's made by the coach. Um, if a student comes in and the coach decides for the first year, we're gonna have you sit out from all competition, a lot of times they'll say, we're gonna retro you your first year. Um, that is one way it happens. The other is for division one, there's something called an academic redshirt for an academic decision. So if you were close to meeting requirements, but not, you won't be able to compete. That's something that we actually force on you and force on the coach. Okay, thank you. So is having a sponsor an obstacle to eligibility? Very, very good question. Uh, it can be, you know, full, full disclosure. You know, so the things that uh, we, we would look for with the sponsor is uh, what is the sponsor doing? And is the sponsor providing you something different or, or an addition because you're a, a talented athlete? You know, our NCAA rules will limit students from, you know, receiving funding money that is more than their expenses for competing in that sport. So, you know, we certainly have plenty of eligible students who use individual sponsors, who fundraise, who uh, you know, have sponsorships that will cover the cost of competing in their sport. Because we get it, you know, playing, playing sport is expensive and especially for talented athletes who play a lot like the ones we're talking to today. So biggest thing to keep in mind is, you know, there are limits to what you can take. And, you know, th those limits are you shouldn't have more money than your cost at the end of the day. But to answer the question, uh, no, there's not a uh, quote unquote you know, restriction against a, a student having a sponsor. Okay, thank you both. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Uh, Mike and Sarah, do, um, does each of you have a final thought uh, for our friends on Facebook? So I think the one thing that we want to just make sure that y'all know is we didn't get to everything about our process today. So please utilize our resources. Please contact us if you have questions. Um, it is a difficult and complicated process. That's something that we understand. Um, but because we do understand that, we want to make sure that you know where to go for your questions. So again, the, the most important thing for us at on the customer service side for international students, there is that contact form that's on the international web page. So please check it out. Please check out our resources and let us know if you have questions. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you both so much for joining us today. And of course, thank you to our international student, Liam. Uh, very special thanks to our viewing groups gathered around the world, including a viewing group gathered at the Fulbright Commission in Ottawa, Canada, host of the Education USA Advising Center. Um, there's also Education USA St. Uh, Kitts and Nevis, uh, Education USA Abuja in Nigeria, and uh, the American Corner Education USA Center in Bitola, Macedonia. Uh, thanks uh, for you, to you all. You can find more information about studying in the United States by visiting the Education USA website at www.educationusa.state.gov. There you can find information on the five steps to US study, locate an Education USA center in your country, one of 426 around the world, connect with us via social media, learn about both in-person and virtual upcoming events, research financial aid opportunities, and much more. Thank you, and please join us for future Education USA interactive web chats. Goodbye from Washington.